In the last video, I dealt with a few OBD2 codes quickly. I thought this is the way it should work. Scan the code, look for the solution online, and fix it. Easy. This gave me some confidence. And then I started dealing with PO171. That's when I realized there's more to being a mechanic than just scanning these codes. PO171 indicates the system is too lean on bank one. In other words, there's an issue with the air fuel mixture where the ECU has determined that the system is running lean and it's trying to compensate. PO171 had shown up when I was sorting out the other codes, but it was always eliminated every time I did an ECU reset. And then the truck would run for a few weeks or a month without a pending code. I got excited and I thought it was time to take it in to uh, get my emissions testing. And then inevitably it popped up again. And this one almost made me sell the truck as I couldn't register it unless I fixed it. One of the key skills I had to learn to confirm that vacuum leaks really were the source of the issues that I was having was to understand fuel trim. So effectively fuel trim is the ECU trying to compensate for issues in the air fuel mixture. The fuel trims ideally should be pretty close to zero. But when you have a vacuum leak, when you're idle, you're gonna see long-term and or short-term fuel trims that are very, very high positive numbers. I had plus 34 in my truck before I, uh, before I fixed my vacuum leaks. Now, another key thing is that if it is a vacuum leak, these fuel trims will change with RPM and they'll decrease as you start increasing load and increasing RPMs. So if I was to rev the truck up and start driving it, I would see that my fuel trim would come back to normal close to close to zero you know under two three thousand rpm of load it's because that at that point most of the air is now coming through the mass airflow sensor not coming through this unmetered vacuum source first gen sidekicks and trackers have extensive vacuum systems to control engine features mainly emissions there's dozens of hose connections some of them are clamped others are not from the factory Based on the fuel trim numbers, I was confident that I had a vacuum leak, and now I needed to find it. So this is one of the methods I was taught to hunt for vacuum leaks, and that's to spray some sort of fuel source on your vacuum hoses or anywhere you have a uh, vacuum gasket, and look for a bump in engine RPM, indicating that the fuel is getting into the engine. And just spray it around all these many, many vacuum hoses you've got, looking for the leaks. Now, I did this over and over again when I was looking for my initial vacuum leaks and I couldn't find anything. So I pe if I peel off one of the hoses here and create a real leak, you can hear the vacuum pulling. And the engine starts to stumble a little bit, indicating we've got a vacuum leak. But I start spraying fuel around it. It really doesn't do much of anything. So I'm pretty suspicious that my leak test system is doing any good at all. So here's my solution to finding the vacuum leaks. I read online that a number of people had great success with smoke machines. Now usually I'd go and buy the proper tool to do this testing but I couldn't find anything online that was even remotely um, affordable to do the job. So I followed some of the instructions for building your own consists of a cheap Harbor Freight soldering iron, a mason jar with uh, some mineral oil, and a wick. And I used some burlap cloth I had to draw the mineral oil up and get it on around the edges of the soldering iron. The other two things that I've got on here is an inlet, just a standard trader valve, so I can push some air into this, and then an outlet where the smoke comes out. And if you think this thing is sketchy, well, it is. I wouldn't leave it on the coffee table if any of my cop friends came around, but it does the job as I'm about to show. So after letting this thing warm up, I've got it here in the engine bay, connected to my portable 12 volt air compressor that I use for tire inflation. And I found this was the perfect tool for pushing the smoke out of this machine because it produces a small airflow and I can control it really easily here by just uh, connecting and disconnecting to the battery. And that's exactly what you want out of a smoke machine for doing vacuum leak testing. So I've moved the smoke machine out of the way so we can see what happens when we push some smoke into the intake manifold. 
Now I've purposely removed the spring clamp on a couple of vacuum connections. We can already see some smoke coming through. And the fix is as simple as that. Spring clamps on every vacuum tube. And now, no more leaks. Another component I replaced, uh, just to be sure, because it might be a vacuum leak source, but it's also part of the 60,000 mile service, is the PCV valve. Uh, super easy component to replace, inexpensive, and here it just plugs into the top of the uh, valve cover. After adding clamps to every hose in my vacuum system, I never encounter PO171 again. Now, I've been driving the truck for six months now, so I'm fairly confident this one is fixed. As you saw, fixing vacuum leaks is cheap and easy once you find them, either a hose or a clamp. But to be honest, I struggled for months until I started using the smoke system, and smoke was the only thing that allowed me to find these leaks. So after fixing PO171, I started doing the drive cycles to get the truck ready for its emissions check. I wanted to do this ASAP as I was already months late on renewing my tags. Then I got a new code I'd never seen before, PO443. PO443 indicates a malfunction with the evaporative emissions purge control valve or its control circuit. This code typically showed up when idling after highway driving, which was part of the drive cycle I was using to get ready for emissions testing. And a bit of research indicated the evap system often initiates a purge during idle after cruising. So one of the first things I looked at was the evap purge valve. This is the one that evacuates the can on command from the ECU. So I did a bench test with 12 volts. And it was clear that the valve was opening and closing properly. However, when I did the same test with a vacuum source from the engine, you couldn't hear it open and close. And I can't clearly show that here because it, it was it's, it's overridden by the engine noise. Now I initially tried to replace this with exactly the same valve but quickly discovered they weren't available. And this is the alternative that I came up with. It was the exact same valve doing the same job in the next gen vehicle. It has the same mounting hardware. And even though it's bigger, I was able to mount it on the same bracket in the same position. And all I had to do was change some of the hoses. The hose sizes have increased. Plus, I had to change the electrical connector because it was a different size. So I went to the pick and pull, got the new solenoid, got the corresponding pigtail to match, and was able to wire that directly into my harness. Here's a close-up of that larger perv control valve mounted on the original bracket, mounted right beside the other control solenoid. It wired in there looking pretty much just like factory. No mods needed to any of the hoses other than just changing the size of them and uh, swapping out a couple of T-couplings. Another thing I learned along the way is how to use my ultra gauge to make sure I'm ready for emissions testing. I was going into the emissions testing place multiple times per day trying to figure out whether I fixed something or not. And I didn't know is I could use the ultra, ga ultra gauge to tell me the status of the OBD2 system and whether or not it was ready for testing. So I'll just show you quickly how to do it on this unit. If I go into my main menu and more, there's an option called readiness. And what it's showing here are the exact same checks that were going to be done at the OBD2 testing station. Because this scanner is plugged into the OBD2 port the same way the scanner at the emissions testing station is, at least for federal checks. Now, what you can see here is I'm not ready for my Catalyst E585. That's always been no. I've never seen it go correct. I'm not ready for evaporative, and I'm not ready for EGR. That's another one that's never gone ready is EGR, even though I don't show any EGR codes and I don't show any evaporative codes, and I don't show catalyst codes either. The key to passing federal OED2 is to have no more than two of these not ready. And once I do a large amount of driving, the evaporative always goes ready. Turns out I bought a jerry-rigged truck where the check engine light bulb that we removed to hide the fact that 
I've also seen honest sellers who say the check engine light has been on in their trucks for 10 years, but there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with the way it drives. My initial goal in fixing these codes was, and, the, and this check engine light problem was to just pass the federal emission standards that are required for registration here in Portland, Oregon. But now that all of these codes have been fixed for the last six months, I can easily say the truck drives better than ever. I also took care of a major issue I had with intermittent fogging when doing long idles and stop and go traffic. And I'm pretty sure that this is also going to help the engine last longer if the ECU now is running um, with in-spec on the air fuel mixture at all times. So when I bought the truck, it was running in limp mode. Uh, these trucks run really well in limp mode, so it wasn't clear to me at the time that there was anything wrong. I made a mistake. I should have confirmed that the check engine light was working correctly before I bought the truck. I should have also brought my scanner, but I'm glad I bought this truck anyway. It's had no other significant issues, and now that I've got all of these codes sorted out, I couldn't be happier.